Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you who are here and you who are in the parking lot and you who are online. We're glad everyone is tuned in and here this morning. Uh, we had a great time yesterday at the uh, Fall Festival, didn't we? A great time. We uh, appreciate all those who uh, uh, helped out with that. We uh, had, gosh, had more trunks than we were expecting, quite a few more than we expected because we were kind of low with uh, you know everything going on. But uh, it was great to see everybody together and just having a good time. And uh, and appreciate the help. Hey, I just want to make just an announcement. Uh, we decided we're going to start informing you about COVID situations. And uh, last Sunday, we had a person who was here who has tested positive to COVID. Uh, and so they're in isolation and everything. But uh, we, can't, we won't give names or anything. But if we knew you were around, then we would let you know, okay? But the uh, bottom line is if everyone would uh, continue to follow our practices of mass separation, you know, no touching kind of stuff, that takes care of itself usually. But uh, so uh, just want to keep you posted on a weekend basis when we have someone that's tested positive to COVID. Uh, so you'll be aware of that, okay? And uh, just be praying for those in isolation and those uh, who are sick. And it'll get to the point, uh, how many know someone has COVID now? I, you know, I know two or three or four people have COVID, you know. So uh, just be praying for those people. And we'll keep you informed. And if uh, we know uh, for sure that you were close to somebody with We'd let you know, and if you were, you've probably been contacted anyway, so uh, leave that uh, there for you. Also, be in prayer for Madison Baptist Church. Uh, Mark Loman, their pastor of 13 years, uh, went to be with the Lord uh, Wednesday. Uh, pastor Bob was scheduled to fill in for him this Sunday because uh, Mark had been sick, and, uh, and Bob's still preaching there this morning, but instead uh, he went to be with the Lord, uh, Pastor Loman. So be in prayer for Bob as he speaks at Madison Baptist Church this morning. Uh, where the pastor just passed away, and be in prayer for the Loman family. Uh, be missed. He's been around here like, what, 13 years in association pastoring, and, and that's a tragic event. So be praying for them. Not for him. He's with the Lord. Amen? Uh, but for those left behind. Hey, by the way, uh, shoe boxes. We will be uh, packing the shoe boxes November. I believe it's 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. We kind of uh, hone that in a little bit. But uh, put that on your calendar. Uh, time to pack shoe boxes already. Can you believe that? And time change is coming up, too. So we're getting in the fall. And matter of fact, we almost had some snow today. I wish we would have had a little bit just to kind of make me feel better. But anyway, uh, we're uh, keep that in mind. Uh, also, members meeting this Wednesday night. And it's good to have our missionaries, Devin and Charity Schlody and the family with us this morning. They'll be speaking in a, a few moments to us. But this time, we're going to have uh, Brother Kelly's going to come and lead us in our uh, uh, deacon prayers. We'll get started. And we're just glad everybody's here this morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, gracious God, we just, um, we praise you this morning. We praise your name, the name above all names, and we just give you all honor and glory. And uh, we're just so th very thankful to be here and to, to gather, uh, whether it's here in person or online or in the parking lot. Um, we are together worship worshiping you and lifting your holy name. I'm thankful or I'm thinking of the, the Madison Church Baptist Church this morning and their loss there and we just pray uh, for comfort for the family and, and direction for that church and uh, we rejoice uh, that another one has been added to heaven um, but we're also thinking of the, those that are left behind and uh, just give them peace and comfort as they as they work through this and, and Lord we're also uh, thankful that the Shlodis are here th this morning we just ask uh, that you continue to bless that family and to protect them um, during their work for you. Father God, I love you. Uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. We're going to be uh, singing some music. I got some uh, scripture to read. Our songs uh, this morning talks about uh, the cross, the blood of Jesus, uh, glory be his name. Uh, he takes away, uh, takes away our sin and by faith. Uh, the uh, third song we're going to sing is, it sets us free. Broken from every chain, salvation is in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, our living hope. And our scripture today is in 1 Peter 1, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, by the grace of God that we can sing songs that lift God up and, and praise be to him and, and get our spiritual morning going, thinking about the cross, the baby Jesus, the walk that Jesus did for us to the cross. 
and he rose again. We, we serve a living God. Uh, First Peter, uh, bless, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And that's what our third song is about, the living hope that we have right here, that we, uh, we live today for the salvation when we, when we get to heaven. Our salvation will be eternal life with Jesus. It says a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from, from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable and defiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, for you, for us that believe Jesus Christ. And five is who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So as they sing these songs, think about how awesome it is to have these seasons where we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, but we all also want to remember we celebrate his walk to the cross, we celebrate his death and his burial and the resurrection, that we get to live a living hope today in Jesus Christ that is alive, waiting for us, preparing us a place in heaven. That's our salvation when we get there. So if you will, who can stand, go ahead and stand. Uh, we sing with the people on the internet and also out in the parking lot. Praise be to God.
living hope.
Father God, you are the living hope we have while we walk through this earth. Oh, thank you for your son. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for choosing us. We thank you for this church family, our pastors. Lord, thank you for loving us and choosing us. We pray now and lift up this service to you, that it be offering to you, glorifying you and your kingdom. We take none of it ourselves. Be with Devin as he gets this message ready. He's got in his mind exactly what you want him to say, Lord talking about missionaries all over the world, where they're going, what they want to do, Lord, to glorify you and your kingdom, their hearts. Anyone here today don't know you as their personal Savior, that you would work through Devin and his message. Use us as Christians, as followers of Jesus that want to live by you, like you, follow you, be examples of you and what you've done on your way to the cross. You're making a place for us as we speak. Today might be the first day of the rest of their life knowing you as their personal Savior. May you be glorified in everything that's done here this morning, Lord. But your kingdom, your work, what your plan is, bring us to you today. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, was introduced, we are Devin and Charity Schlody. Um, so grateful to be here with you guys this morning uh, on this uh, rather dreary morning. Uh, fortunately, there is no snow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we wanted to take a few minutes uh, first before uh, I have a sermon uh, just to kind of share a little bit more about what we've been doing in Papua New Guinea. So I'm going to turn it over to Charity to get us started. Um, so for those of you who may not be too familiar with our story, uh, we joined Wycliffe in 2016, or 17, I guess, mm. right after our daughter, Testa, was born. Um, and we have been in Papua New Guinea for a year now. Um, I guess we also <laughs> should go ahead and point out, too, that we have a new little one with us since last time. You're here, Haddon, and we're hoping he doesn't uh, share his joyful noise with the Lord <laughs> during the service. Uh, hopefully he stays quiet. Um, but so we have been over there uh, since last summer, and where I serve as a teacher in Devon's terms as a translator. Um, we joined Wycliffe. Um, really, one of the key things that really drew us to the ministry of Wycliffe um, was Devon went to a, a recruitment event, and they, they said the phrase that there are two eternal things in this world, the souls of men and the word of God. And we get really excited that we get to be part of making the latter more accessible so the former can be saved. Um, the ministry of Wycliffe is to make sure that uh, everyone around the world has a Bible they can read about in what we call their hard language. That's the language that they talk at home. That's the one that they uh, write stories in and, and talk to their families in and, and dream in. That, that's um, the, the language that we want to make sure the most, the easiest language for them to understand. They have access to the scripture. And there are many languages um, around the world today that do not have that luxury. So that's what we do. Um, here is a picture of us, uh, one is uh, us in front of our village house, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we had some training and some time in the village. And the other one is uh, our house in um, Ukarumpa. So uh, that is where we spend most of our time. That is where the school is at. Um, and yeah, I'll turn it over. You talk a little bit about Papua New Guinea. Yeah, so um, Papua New Guinea is an island nation. Um, I'm sure most of you, have, at least uh, if we've talked to you at all, you've heard a little bit about it um, nowadays. Uh, there are over 800 languages represented on the island. Uh, it's the most linguistically diverse place on the earth. Um, about 17% of the languages, of the earth's languages are there on pa in Papua New Guinea. And it's about the size of California. Uh, it's very mountainous, uh, lots of swamps, lots of jungle. Obviously, lots of ocean uh, coastline as well. So very, very diverse place. Uh, just a vibrant, beautiful place as well. Uh, you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of that from our picture with our house there. There's some big, massive pine-type trees behind there. And then there's some, uh, just down the road, we have some palm trees as well. Because uh, where we're at in, in Ukarumpa is actually uh, about the same elevation as Colorado Springs. So Quite a, quite a bit higher than uh, flat Missouri or Iowa that we're used to. Uh, and Ukarumpa is kind of almost smack dab in the middle of the main island. That's the other thing is Papua New Guinea is made up of the big island, but then has a lot of small chains of islands as well. 
Um, and so that's another thing that contributes to the linguistic diversity of the island. Uh, but Ukurumpa, our center, is kind of in the center of the island. And this is where we kind of strategically work from. Um, we have lots of, of, of personnel that work there in support roles. So this is administration. We've got pilots, as Charity mentioned, the school is there that teaches the missionary kids. Um, we have a store there that is, uh, operates logistics to get us supplies uh, for us to use, you know, basic foodstuffs and you know, every so often some fun stuff that we, you know, don't always get in PNG. It was actually really just a, a little funny story. We were, first time we were shopping in the store, I, was, I had lamented to Charity that I forgot to bring any hot sauce with us. You know, I was thinking Papua New Guineans don't really care for hot sauce and so it's pretty hard to find, they told us. And I was like, man, I forgot to pack some. And we go walking down the aisle and they had like three different varieties of hot sauce. And I was like, woohoo, I, I can survive. And so, yeah, they were all gone the next month. But it, I, I stocked up before they went. So, um, but yeah, Ukarumpa is uh, a center of about 500 houses or so. Uh, as I said, a store, a school. Uh, there's a, a large teen center, you know, basically has a gymnasium type kind of building and a, a large kitchen for the students uh, to hang out in and, and, and have some you know, time to enjoy themselves. Uh, another neat thing they do, uh, since a lot of the students there don't get a chance to have a, a job as a teenager, you know, because they're growing up overseas, um, they do what they call burger nights, where every Friday night or a couple Fridays throughout the semester, the teens will cook burgers, cook hot dogs, and several other things like that. And the families on the center can come and take a break from having to cook um, and order a burger and sit down and the kids will cook it and then serve you as well, bring it out. And, um, and that way they have something they can put on their resume when they come back for college and volunteer work and things like that. So it's just, it's a really neat community. Um, we have really enjoyed getting to plug in there and be a part of that. Uh, the one last thing I'll say about Ukarumpa is we have on center, we've got two different churches essentially that operate. One is a Talk Pisin church, which is the, the trade language of Papua New Guinea. And so that actually, you know, the entire service is in Talk Pisin. And it's really fun for us as we're learning Talk Pisin to get to sit and just worship, you know, sing songs together with other Papua New Guineans that are there uh, in Talk Pisin. And then also to hear sermons in Talk Pisin. Um, not only from some of our Papua New Guinean colleagues, but some of our expat colleagues that have been there for a long time that will preach uh, as well in Talk Pizen. And then we also have an English service um, because the majority of our uh, center is English speaking uh, as well. And so we are represented by, we have Dutch, we have Swedish, Norwegian, uh, we have Japanese, we have Korean, uh, there's, and Australians obviously, and a lot of Americans. And so very, very diverse as far as the expat community goes as well. Um, so English is kind of the, the other language that gets used the majority of the time. Um, and so it's been really uh, just lovely and beautiful for us to get to plug into that community as we then are also working to connect uh, outside of Ukarumpa as well. Oh, yep. Yeah, so this is a, it's a little hard to see, um, but this is an, a flyover as we're coming into Ukarumpa. Um, it's kind of on the, the side of a big hill. It kind of goes up a mountain in a way. Um, so you're either always going uphill or always going downhill. There's no, no real flat spaces there. And there is a river that kind of uh, flows around the outside of it. Uh, we haven't gotten the chance to yet, but some, several people have told us they've gone floating in some inner tubes around uh, the river there. And then we'll also, the Talk Pizen uh, Church will have baptisms down at the river uh, every so often. So it's just been really great to get to plug in and be a part of the community there in Ukarumpa. And this is just, this is actually down in, uh, when we were doing our village living, as we said, we'll talk a little bit more about but just to kind of give you another uh, picture of just how beautiful it is. I mean, you just walk through these fields of, you know, five-foot grass, um, just ni nice breeze. It would rain nearly every single day in the afternoon and just cool everything off. And just a really neat place. Uh, very, very different than what we're used to, I think, in the Midwest here in America. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about UIS. You can go ahead and do the next yep. one. That's... Um, so this is a bit of my classroom. Um, so UIS, uh, Ukarumba International School, um, serves uh, mainly um, the, the children of missionaries, uh, but not entirely. We also have um, any uh, children from businessmen or other organizations in the area, as well as Papua New Guineans are welcome to attend as well. 
Um, the education system in Papua New Guinea um, is rather difficult. Uh, it costs money and um, it's not guaranteed to be in every area. So we know many families whose children walk, walk um, hours to get to school or sometimes will live with someone else during the week so they can be close to a school then come back. Mm. Um, and so because of that, there are a lot of Papua New Guineans who um, either just aren't educated um, or have very kind of hit or miss spotty education. And so one thing that um, Ukurumpa um, as a community decided, we want to remove any barriers for people being able to come and work uh, and pursue Bible translation. So um, they created Ukurumpa International School. So um, families can come and still know that they have a good um, academic opportunity for their kids to be able to, um, as they return back to their um, home countries, to be able to go on without missing a beat and not um, sacrifice any education uh, to be able to do the Lord's work in PNG. So it's been fun to be a part of that and to be able to uh, be an asset kind of to those families uh, as I teach. I've been teaching science and social studies for fourth and fifth grade, which has been a lot of fun. Um, and one thing as you're praying for Ukurumpa, Ukurumpa International School, um, we often use the phrase TCKs when we talk about the students I teach, and that stands for uh, third culture kids. And we say that because on all of um, these kids' passports, they have a different home country than where they're living now. We call that their host country. So they're kind of um, students torn typically between two different places. And even our Papua New Guineans there feel that in some regards as they are um, learning in a more Western, science, Western style school than returning back into their village settings. And so um, that can be a really um, unnerving and scary place uh, for a child to be kind of in this weird th third culture that's different than their parents. Um, even for example, uh, for, for Kesteda, for example, we came back and just automatically knew that it was fall and that leaves fell from the trees and <laughs> Kesteda was really concerned and we had to explain that and it's something I didn't even think about, the fact that our daughter would not realize that fall, you know, leaves fell from the trees, she just didn't remember that and so um, it can be really unnerving as parents raising a, a child with a different culture than our own who's, who's kind of between these two places. And then as, as a teacher trying to steward um, students well through a lot constant transition and changes as they go back and forth and, and ex have different experiences and those types of things. So um, as you pray for UIS, uh, as you pray for um, all of the students who, who really, uh, it's a great school, a great opportunity for them, but there's a lot of hardships that come, I feel like, when, when you um, go back and forth between your home country and your host country. So you can be praying for them in that. Uh, I also wanted to point out, I have a picture there, it's hard to see, uh, but thank you so much uh, to the church as well as to Hearts and Hands um, for making us, uh, we have mat covers on, um, kind of in that last one, we don't have any carpet uh, on our floor, and my kids like to go around and do different work, uh, and or read, or things like that, and we have these mats that were given to us, but they weren't very nice, and they weren't very comfortable, and so um, I appreciate uh, Hearts and Hands making covers to go over them, and the kids were so excited. And I meant to get a picture with um, the kiddos, but mm. this spring has been kind of a crazy <laughs> one, and that did not happen, but I promise I will get a picture of them using them um, after we get back. I also wanted to show um, some of our house help. Uh, so something else that I do besides teaching, uh, typically during the day, is, is I um, am mainly responsible for um, organizing and, and communicating with, with our house help. It's very culturally appropriate for us over there to have Papua New Guineans to come and do different things around our house. And uh, I have a picture here. This is Miss Uraso. She's our house Mary. Uh, so essentially she comes and works in the house. She'll often watch Kesteda for us um, in the afternoons when I'm teaching or help um, you know, clean or, or laundry and those types of things. Um, I didn't have a better picture of her. This is actually right as, as COVID hit PNG and the center was on lockdown. So I got a picture of her from across the fence. When we were, that's the best we were able to see really um, from her at that time because uh, we were um, isolated, but um, she is really sweet. She walks two hours every morning to get to our house um, to, to work, and uh, you can be um, praying for her. I know we talk about her often, um, but that, that's, she's our uh, house Mary, and we also have a yard Mary and yard man, and so they come, and they uh, just help maintain the grounds, so everything grows in Papua New Guinea, so they help uh, maintain garden and, and our grass and, and all of that. And their names are Ruth and Maxie, and so you might also hear from about them sometimes in our communications. Um, I, I wanted to let you guys know their names and maybe even a picture as you guys are thinking about us. Uh, it's building relationships. Uh, we've noticed has been a big challenge in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's assumed that we have a lot of money and that we have power. Uh, and because of that, uh, sometimes it's hard to actually form genuine relationships. Uh, and we want to do that. We want to actually build uh, true friendships. 
uh, and not um, stereotypical uh, relationships that can often happen in these types of situations. And so you can pray for us as we try to navigate those cultural waters, which have been rather difficult for us. Yeah. Uh, I want to just kind of address uh, the training center. So next to our center there in Ukarumpa, we have what's called the Training Center for National Translators. And so this is, uh, it's, it's kind of its own little um, college, you could say. Um, most Papua New Guineans don't complete high school. Uh, they usually have somewhere between 6th grade and 12th grade education. And it, it just varies at what time they left school or how far you know, because again, as Charity said, you have to pay for schooling, and so, you know, were, they act, were their parents able to afford it for them to finish out? Um, and so it's very, very rare for uh, any Papua New Guinean to have finished high school, let alone go, go on to college. And so one of the things the training center does is kind of help to bridge that gap for these uh, men and women that are coming um, or, or becoming part of a translation team and becoming a translator. And so there, the classes that we teach there range from anywhere from like basic computing to how do I even sit down and turn on a computer and use it that they may have never seen before, all the way through to what this class was teaching, which was uh, basic exegesis. And so it is definitely more of a, a Bible college type focus, uh, but with some like gen ed type things included to help um, these men and women get up to speed with uh, using technology and even English proficiency is sometimes taught um, because we do teach nearly all of our classes in uh, English as well. But yeah, this picture, uh, this class of uh, basic exegesis, um, I've gotten to help out with that one, uh, with a Hebrew course, and also with a technology uh, teaching the Logos Bible uh, software as well. Um, and then I got to help out with a cluster project that was working on their Old Testament. So this is a cluster meaning five different language groups coming together um, and working on their own translation, but then getting some teaching on the passages of the Old Testament that they were translating. Um, getting advice from a consultant at various times, and then also working with a scripture use worker as well to talk about how to engage this scripture in their church services. Because when you've had a church plant that has never had a Bible, you kind of start just doing things without it. And so talking about how do we actually start incorporating the scripture and actually using it in our service, not just uh, to have it and it sit over here on the, on the bench sort of thing. But to come back to basic exegesis, I um, was just very uh, blown away uh, by these students. Like I said, you know, I don't think a single one of them has beyond a, a 12th grade education. Um, and the other thing to note is that 12th grade education looks very different in Papua New Guinea than it does here in America that you and I have probably experienced. And so um, just w was so impressed with their hard work, with their effort and their, their desire to learn. Uh, every single one of these people uh, works as a translator in some capacity uh, around the islands uh, in different teams and different types of teams. And just every single one of them, um, no matter like their level of English or even just their, uh, the level of faith that they had, a couple of these guys, I would say, were very new believers. Uh, but they were just so desirous to know and understand God's word and to treat it um, respectfully and, and to use it well. Uh, one of the, the, the men came from one of the, the outlying islands, an island named Manus, and uh, he shared on the last day, uh, we were just kind of asking for, hey, what have you gotten out of this three-week course? What have you learned, and, and what's, what are you going to take away? And one of the things he, he said just really struck me that, you know, I've had all this education, and just this, the, the way he succinctly uh, put this, he said, you know, for, for a long time I've been a translator, but translation is like catching fish. He's like, you know, we, we often will go out and catch fish from the waters to feed our family. And translation is like that. Translation is like catching the fish so that it's actually right here in front of you so that you can eat it. Because if it's out there in the ocean, it doesn't do you any good as food. He said, but, but this class, this exegesis class has taught me that translation is not enough. That we, we need translation. We need to catch the fish. But if you don't come along and cook the fish, you know, prepare the fish and make it edible then it's very, very difficult to eat it. There's lots of bones in it. There's scales. It, you know, if it's raw, it might hurt you. It might even you know, make you sick. He said, but exegesis a lot of times is like cooking the fish. And he said this, this idea of rightly handling the word of God is like preparing a good meal. And it just, it just blew me away. It was just this, this man, probably 55, 60 years old, just so well described what we want to do. We want to catch fish. We want to bring the Bible to them in their language they best understand. 
We also want to prepare pastors and other translators as well to rightly handle it, to cook it well, and to be able to teach and preach and give it to the people that they, they minister to throughout the island. And so just was really um, humbled and encouraged by that, uh, by that analogy, by that metaphor that he gave. And so just, um, I, I will say, like, it, it's just been so neat for me getting to help out with these classes. Um, with all the learning that I've done, just getting to see through their eyes as the Lord opens their eyes, as the Lord teaches these, them these things. And one last thing I'll say about the classes uh, with the Hebrew class was a six-week course uh, basically eight to five every single day, Monday through Friday. And they probably learned more in those six weeks than I did in an entire year of Hebrew. And, and that primarily goes to their diligence and effort. Of just They're so desirous to learn and to know God's word. And it, was just, it blew me away sitting there watching these guys. They would, they would sit in class from eight to five, and then they'd go back and they'd do homework for two or three hours every single night to do more translation, no more practice writing in the Hebrew language. And so just uh, was very convicted and humbled by uh, these Papua New Guinean men and women that really want God's word and desire to do the right thing with God's word as well. All right, I'm just going to share briefly just a little bit about um, our training and our village living experience. So part of our last year was also spent um, getting used to Papua New Guinea and the culture um, and the way that the majority of Papua New Guineans live, which is in a village setting. So as we travel to and from village settings, we'll know how to um, live and survive. So this is just some pictures from our training, learning to cook over the fire. Um, we did a lot of hiking to get in shape um, <laughs> and those types of things. You keep going. So we learned a lot of different ways that Papua New Guineans prepare food. Um, don't ask me to do any of those because <laughs> I can't. Uh, but I've eaten all of those ways that they cook food. It's really, really good. Um, but they are very, um, uh, they have a very rich culture of preparing food. And so it's typically outside. Uh, this one here on the side, they, they heat rocks. Um, and that's all they do is all that's on the fire is rocks. And then everything else is in coconut milk, uh, kind of separate in a pot. And after the rocks get really hot, they, they move the rocks into the pot, and that causes the uh, coconut milk to boil, and it cooks the food that way, which is really interesting. Um, they use banana leaves often as, as skillets or as, as lids to help keep steam in. They use a lot of uh, steam for the different things. Um, they uh, will dig, a, they call it moo-moo. They dig a big hole, and they'll do maybe kind of like what we do, like a pig roast. Um, they use uh, bamboo. They'll cook inside bamboo. Um, they call that mambu. So they have a lot of different ways that they cook food that we got to experience and, and learn, and they tried to teach us again. <laughs> um, don't think I mastered any of that. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah, and then uh, this is, a, again, a village house that we lived in uh, in Madzam. Um, and one of the... Uh, so this is down in, in the lowlands area, and so it's a different language group than we've lived around up in Ukurumpa. Um, they, live, they speak the language of Adzera, and there is a, a, a translation project that's been ongoing in this group uh, for a long time. Um, but it was really neat. We were able to bring a couple um, books of the Bible that had been translated. I was able to pick up from one of our publishers uh, up in Ukurumpa and bring down with us as a gift to our family that was, our ho was hosting us. Uh, so you can kind of see here the, the uh, is there, yeah, this, this area right here is a, a, a house cook is what we call it. It's basically the outdoor kitchen. Uh, it's, it's open air, you know, to let the breeze blow through since obviously cooking over fire can get very hot. Um, but it also has the shade to keep the sun out. Um, and so we would basically spend the majority of our time uh, sitting out here in the house cook just chatting, enjoying each other. Um, oftentimes there would be something on the fire boiling or you know, slow cooking uh, for a meal later on. Uh, but the majority of our time would be spent here just uh, getting to know each other and talking. Um, and then, yeah, so this is just showing some more of the uh, experience of village living here. Um, the picture with Kesida over here uh, is with one of our wasp papa, our host father's grandsons. Um, so she got to, she, we bought her a, a little PNG outfit, and he was wearing um, an outfit of the region, of, the, of the, the particular province. That's their flag that he's wearing on his shirt. And so they wanted a, a picture of the two of them together because they said, oh, they're men and Mary of Papua New Guinea to, together. Yeah. And then the, the picture of me here sitting uh, with this big, big knife. Um, the, the men in the lowlands uh, use what they call a guy fagan. It's basically just a, a long knife, bush knife, 
that they used to mow grass, to chop down trees, to do basically anything. Um, and so I had, I had brought a bush knife, and so I asked our wasp papa, could you make mine into a, a Gaifa gun? So instead of having a short little handle, it's got a, about a two-foot handle on it. And he, he was like, yes, but I have to tell you, if I do this, you know, you're going to go back up to the highlands. And those highlands men, they're going to want to use this to, to do other things besides cut grass. And so he, he was just making a joke that the, the lowlands people think of the highlands people as very violent. Uh, the, historically, they've been the more uh, the, the people that like to fight and like to, to have war. And so he would say that any time a highlands man will come down, they'll see their knives and like, oh, I need one of those to take back up and, and to, to use on, on my enemies. And so he was like, but make sure like this is just for, for cutting grass and just for uh, working in the garden. And then uh, I think we have another slide, right? Yeah, and then right here, uh, just a few more pictures. We're doing a little tug of war. Um, here's some stuff to keep the kids entertained. Uh, we try to bring some coloring books and different things for the kids. And then, yeah, the other picture of me here with our wasp papa is uh, him reading from the book of Genesis. And um, this is actually the first um, piece of scripture he's actually held in his hands. He's seen the Bible in Azera before. Uh, and he's had a talk pizen Bible, but this is the first in Adzera, in his language, that he's ever held in his hands. And so it was just, it was really, really neat to be able to give it to him and sit down and, and even have him talk about it and be like, oh, yes, like, you know, I know this. He, he knew the stories. It wasn't that he had never heard about Genesis, but to be able to read it in his own language, it was neat to see him kind of put pieces together and kind of make, connect some dots that he hadn't before. So we were able to give him Genesis as well as Mark. Um, and then they'd also had translated a group of, um, of stories as well, of, of legends from the, their Adzera people. And so he was just, he was over the moon uh, to receive those and to be able to read that in his language. Just as we kind of close out, because uh, we could probably talk about Papua New Guinea um, for a long time, so feel free if you have questions to uh, ask us. But just we wanted to lift up just a few uh, prayer requests. Um, I kind of mentioned as we were talking um, some throughout, but also uh, our village living experience was mainly to help us learn uh, talk pisin and um, cultural uh, different things. And so continue to pray for us on that front. Uh, again, PNG has a rich culture and uh, it definitely takes some adjustment and a lot of learning. We've made a lot of mishaps along the way. So you can be praying for us as we continue to, to learn um, their culture and language. Um, talk Pisin shouldn't, it doesn't seem like it should be that hard. There's only like 2,000 vocabulary words, but they use those words to mean all kinds of things. And so it can be really hard to try to figure out exactly what is being said to us, even though we know all the vocabulary. So you can pray for us um, on that. And then also, once we go back, Devin will be um, joining a specific project uh, to, uh, uh, along with us, I will be continue teaching, and he'll continue teaching at the training center. But he'll also be uh, joining with a specific language project uh, to help them um, with different uh, translation and exegesis mm -hmm. elements to that. So just some prayer requests. Um, also, prayer that we get back. Uh, we are in the process of trying to do that, uh, but uh, it's been rather difficult. A lot of hoops for us to jump through that we are in process, uh, looking to head back either December or January, um, provided paperwork goes through. So you can be praying for us in that. Um, we also, uh, we have uh, give up there, and, and it's a, a good time for me to say just in front of you, thank you so much for your uh, support, both prayer and financial, to allow us to be able to do what we do. Uh, we could not be in Papua New Guinea uh, without the support of our family, so thank you for that. Um, we've had to raise our budget just a little bit with the addition of, of Haddon. So we are about 96% of mm -hmm. our uh, monthly support right now that we are trying to uh, finish raising so we can uh, return uh, in that December or January time frame. So you can also be praying that that comes quickly. Um, but just kind of as, as we finish, um, and I also too have go up there that often we just put that up there, but we never know how the Lord's working. If, if um, working overseas is ever something you're interested in, please let us know. Wycliffe uses all talents. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we have the need of really... Um, all occupations in, in Papua New Guinea. We have mechanics and pilots and uh, administration and, and we have people who we need to manage the store and do our purchase orders and all of those things. So if that's ever something that's interested to you, please let us know. But just before uh, we leave, um, I, I know I've shared this story before, but um, we just want to make sure that um, we do a good job of sharing of just how important your, your partnership is for us. Uh, William Carey, there's a story of him uh, sitting with a group of believers, and one of the believers said that when he was, they were talking about India, 
He said, there seems to be a gold mine of lost souls in India, but it seems as deep as the center of the earth. Um, who will go explore it? And William Carey famously said, well, I will go, but you, my brothers, must hold the ropes. And that's how we view um, New Life and our partners here stateside. Um, we hope that you view what we do in Papua New Guinea as an extension of your own ministry. Um, your hands are on those pieces of scripture that we are working on, and your um, hands are, are part of the education that we're able to give the kids over there. So thank you for that, and mm -hmm. thank you for being our rope holders. Yes, thank you so much. So I just, uh, we only have a few minutes here, but I wanted to, uh, if you would, take your Bibles um, and open to Psalm 22 with me. Um, just want to share a few thoughts uh, about this, this song in the book of songs. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. I'm just going to read the first uh, few verses here to start with. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the wounds, the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. They trust. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. They say, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I imagine these first couple verses make you think of someone else. Uh, as you read David's words, uh, we often, I think, immediately think of Jesus on the cross. When he cries out to the Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we, we also think of him in the garden when he's crying at night, shedding tears, uh, uh, sweat, sweating drops of blood, um, crying out to God, and yet he seems to have no answer, just like the psalmist here, just like David here. And similarly, you know, just like David says, these people mock me. They tell me, he trusts in the Lord, let him save him. Jesus too on the cross, you know, these people come and say, oh, didn't he say in three days he would destroy the temple, and he would bring it back? Well, then let him, if he is the Son of God, let him take himself off the cross and save himself. They mocked him on the cross. And so we see here in this passage not just uh, a lament of David himself, but also a prophecy of what's, what is to come. But imagine for a moment that you're reading or singing this song during David's time, during the Old Testament, about 1,000 B.C., You've never heard of Jesus. The name means nothing to you. you. You don't know what a crucifixion is. And you have no idea what God's people's Savior is going to look like. You are expecting a Savior. You know, Genesis 3 tells us someone will come, the Son of Man will come, who will crush the serpent's head. But you don't know what he's going to look like. And so at first glance, if you're reading this, this scripture, this, this song, it doesn't read as the song of a Savior. It reads as the song of someone in need of salvation. And so I think we, we often are quick to jump to, oh, this is about Jesus. And we want to skip ahead to, to uh, excuse me, verse 21 and following where things actually turn around. And we'll get there, but I think it's, it's important for us to, to wait a minute, to sit in what is actually happening in the first 20 verses. You know, many of us have experienced one of the hardest years of our lives this year. Uh, a lot of our plans got turned upside down. Uh, a lot of the things we had uh, hoped for got canceled. Uh, a lot of the things we expected to happen didn't. And a world that seemed to make sense in a lot of ways doesn't anymore. You know, none of us were prepared for a year like this. We thought we were stable. But perhaps we weren't really stable at all and just thought we were. 
I think one of the things that we often, uh, especially here in the West, get into a complacency of thinking is that things are okay. Things make sense. Uh, one of the things about Papua New Guinea is there's a lot of earthquakes. Um, just, this, just the other day, we had a lot of our friends post on Facebook that they had about a, a 7.1 uh, earthquake uh, just down the road. It was, the epicenter was just down the road from our center. And just mentioned about how it wasn't that it was so violent that they couldn't even stand, but it's that it went on for four, five, six, seven minutes at a time. Usually they're about 20 or 30 second tremors and they're, they're done. But that was this thing they said it was so unnerving to have this, the ground shaking for this extended period of time. And I think in a lot of ways, for us as humans, that's the reality we live in. We live in a world that is shaking and trembling like a 7.1 earthquake that is constantly happening. But we often get used to it. You know, just about, we always talk about that frog, that if you put the frog in boiling water, he'll immediately jump out. But if you put him in there when it's lukewarm or when it's cold, and then you just slowly bring it up to a boil, he will never notice. And a lot of times that's how we are. Is we're kind of just, we're okay with it because we're used to it. We, we understand it. But that doesn't mean that we aren't being tossed and tormented by a world on fire that is crumbling. You know, we often talk of salvation, but only usually in abstract terms. And so when we are threatened with our way of life being changed, uh, with death even, from an unknown enemy, where do we turn? I think what we see in this psalm, in Psalm 22, is David and Jesus showing us what we need to do. We need to cry out to God even if he is silent or seems to be silent. And we must cry out to God not because we deserve his help, but because we need it so desperately. We are fragile creatures, and even when we may claim invincibility, we are in need. David had a lot of reasons to think he was invincible. He was named king, being the youngest son of Jesse. He defeated the giant Goliath with one little stone. He led many battles, had many victories, and yet we see here in Psalm 22 a man that is broken, a man that is in need. You know, he, he throughout the first uh, 10 or so verses, only refers to God as Elohim, this, this more distant term. And, and it, the, his enemies say, he trusts in Yahweh. And they use it in this, this derogatory way. They, they use it against him and say, oh, he's been so close to this God, to this named God, Yahweh, and yet, and yet. It's, in ESV, it, it translates it as Lord. And it's this idea of connectedness. Of, of, they expect because he has had so much go right for him in his life that nothing should go wrong. This is an ongoing theme, I think, throughout the Old Testament, as well as the New, but we see it in the, in the story of Job. Job is, is righteous. Job does well. And what happens? Things fall apart. His whole world crumbles around him. His, his children die. His entire wealth just disintegrates and goes away. And even his health is taken from him. He sits broken. And we see David here broken. And we see Jesus broken. But Jesus is the one, right? Jesus is the one man in this world that's ever lived that didn't deserve what he got. And yet we see him in the garden, we see him on the cross crying out to God, crying out and waiting. You know, it says, you know, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think we should ask, should Jesus have forsaken the Father when he himself felt forsaken? I think a lot of us want to do that when someone abandons us. I know I felt that way of, well, all right, if you're going to be like that, then I won't talk to you. I won't interact with you. I don't want to do any, have anything to do with you. I know my, my dad has had siblings like that. My dad has, has struggled uh, as, a, as a Catholic to really understand what it means to extend forgiveness and grace. And, and by proxy, even me, even a believer, has struggled to really understand how do I love this person even if they, all they want to do is put up the middle finger to me. But I think we would all say that Jesus shouldn't have forsaken the Father when he felt forsaken. And why? 
because he knew what awaited him on the other side of death. He knew you and I also have that hope when we trust in Christ and salvation. We have to cry out for rescue, for relief and protection, but always be ready to suffer just as our master did. And I think that's one of the hardest things for us to wrap our minds around as believers is that uh, why would we ever accept a lowly position? Why would I be okay with injustice being committed against me? Why would I purposely make more of others than myself? And it's because of what we see in, in passages like Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where Jesus, being God himself, emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, and became humble even to the point of death. That's why you and I do that. We don't seek out pain and suffering for ourselves, but it's often a byproduct of proclaiming the gospel in love to a watching world that is no friend to Jesus. And so, I think what we see here in, in this passage in Psalm 22 is, is this yearning forward for what David does not yet know. You know, David, writing in about 1000 AD, was only 1000 years removed from Jesus. But he couldn't see him. He, you know, he couldn't look forward into the future and know Jesus' name, know what he would be like, know what the crucifixion even, even this glimpse of the crucifixion, he couldn't really grasp what it was all about. But you and I, 2,000 years removed, can look back and know what it's about because we have the Scripture given to us, right? We have the Bible. Jesus tells us, the, the Gospel writers tell us about who Jesus is, what he did on the cross for us. And so we can read this psalm and join David in his yearning. But it's a yearning with, with sight, a yearning with, with a hope that we know. We're not looking forward to something, uh, though we may yearn for the day of, of heaven. We may yearn for the day of the Lord's return. We are not yearning as those who don't have hope. We yearn for Jesus and what he has already done, that he would make it perfect in our lives. And so, even when God seems silent to us, um, in this, this period of, of shaking, in this period of the world not making sense, you and I have to cry out, uh, times it may seem uh, indefinitely. You know, Jesus died on the cross and laid in the grave for three days. I don't know if you can imagine what it was like to be a disciple of Jesus during those three days. The world looked like it had ended. The entire and the entirety of their lives were built on Jesus as Savior, and he was gone. And for those three days, they had to live in waiting. And you and I, uh, until Jesus returns, if he should tarry, have to live waiting. And so we should cry out, ask God that he would come and make himself known, that he would speak to us, because his silence is not forever. And as we cry out and ask for him to come, he will speak and he will work. We have a point in space and time to look back upon and to look to, to believe. You know, many men and women died of crucifixion back in, in ancient times. But only one died because he didn't deserve it. Only one died that was the Son of God. And he was sent to rescue all of humanity. There's a, a line in a song, a lyric that I really love, that he it's not that we say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We get to say with, with all confidence, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? And so there's nothing in you and I, nothing at all that makes us worthy of Jesus, but we bring all of our sin, all of our filth to him, and we can trust in the word of God, in Psalm 22, in Jesus' uh, death on the cross that we read through the Gospels, in what he has done and what he will do in making us perfect. So I just would invite that what, in whatever way the Lord might in, be asking you to, to respond to him, I'll ask Roger to come up and, and music to play maybe. And um, just we're so grateful uh, to be with you. Um, just even as I've preached, I, pr I pray that you would just cherish the word of God that you have in your language. Cherish the word of God that tells you of your confidence and your hope. Um, and if you have any questions about who Jesus is and what he's doing and, and how you can be a part of it or in, in any way that you, the Lord might be prompting you to respond. We're going to pray and sing a little bit. Uh, so you come and, and we'll, uh, we'll be here to pray.